All right, everybody, man, what's happening? It's your boy C. Wells coming at you with another edition of Swag Talk. So we cover the swag inside and out. And today we're going to talk a little Bethune Cookman football. We got our Bethune Cookman season preview coming at you. So we're going to go through that. Um, other than that, man, you know, we just doing what we do. So, you know, make sure y'all tune in to what we're doing. You know, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Um, like the video, share them, hit that notification bell to be alerted to any thing that I drop. Um, you know, I, I drop videos now out, outside my normal Wednesday and Friday schedule. So make sure you check out, hit that notification bell so you'll be alert, alerted to anything that I drop. Um, hit them socials. they on the screen also. Um, Instagram is Face Talk. <laughs> Instagram is Swag Talk. Twitter is Swag Talk 76. Facebook is Swag Talk. Uh, make sure you check that out. Um, of course, we got the Swag Talk tees coming at you. So um, if you if you want one, Man, hit me up. Um, let me throw it on the screen for you. Um, here, here's the shirt. You're white with the Swag Talk logo on there. We got that dropping. Um, one for 25, two for 40. Um, hit me up if you want one. You know, hit the socials. Uh, let me know uh, if, if you want one, and I can hook you up with that. Um, so, you know, you got the Swag Smoke shirt already, man. Copy that Swag Talk shirt and, you know, have your nice little set. So um, hit me up if you're interested in that. And um, without further ado, man, let's talk a little Bethune Cookman football. Um, twenty twenty one was not the best, the best uh, time for the Wildcats. They had a very, very rough season, um, going two and nine and two and six in conference, and actually, um, you know, opening up the season on, on a on a losing streak. Uh, they um, actually. They, they started off the season with a 38-28 loss to U, U, UTEP, um, which they were pretty competitive in. And, um, you know, they, they seemed like they were going to be doing okay. Um, they lost to UCF 63-14. to And then they lost to Alabama State by a score of 30-27. Uh, they lost to Alabama a and Excuse me, lost to Alabama a by a score of 30-27 on a Thursday night game. Um, where they were in that game, they had a good opportunity at the end. They couldn't, they couldn't close it out. Uh, they lost to Alabama State, thirty-eight to twenty-four. They lost to South Carolina State, forty-two to thirty-five. In a game, they fell behind big and made a nice rally to kind of get back in it. Um, they lost to Valley, twenty to fourteen. Uh, they lost to Prairie View, thirty-five twenty-nine. They lost to Jackson State, forty-two to twelve. They beat Alcorn for their first win of the season, uh, thirty-five thirty-one. And then they beat Grambling 31-14, and they closed out their season with a 46-21 loss to Florida and them in the Florida Classic, which, you know, basically ended their season and ended that long winning streak that they had over the Rattlers. Um, one thing that stands out to me about this season is they had a lot of uh, single-digit losses. Um, they had... Um, They had four four single digit losses out of the out of the nine games they lost. Um, they lost another couple games by fourteen or less. Uh, they did get blow they did get blowed out a couple of times, but they a lot of their losses were really close. Um, a play here or there could have could have you know helped them out. Um, they just couldn't you know couldn't really get it going. Um, you know one way or the other to kind of get themselves back on track. Uh, statistically. The, the offense averaged 24 points a game. They had 37 touchdowns, four uh, field goals, 30 extra points, and um, no uh, no two-point conversions. Defensively, they allowed an average of 36.3 points. So, as you can see, they gave up a ton of points, and they didn't really score a lot of points. Uh, they allowed 54 touchdowns, which uh, was the second most in the, in the conference. Um, eight field goals, 51 extra points on the season for the opponents. Uh, total offense, uh, they averaged 326 yards per game, um, 5.6 yards per play, which you know is like a middle of the middle of the pack. Well, that that was good for fifth in uh, fifth in the conference in yards per play. So they were able to move the ball. That that wasn't the issue. Moving the ball wasn't the issue. Finishing drives was their biggest issue. Uh, defensively, they were tenth in the league at 428 yards per game. And they allowed an average of six point five yards, six yards per play, which was eighth in the league. So they defensively, like I said, they just couldn't really get any stops. Uh, running offense, they were eighth in the league at one hundred and fourteen yards per game. They averaged four point one yards per carry. 
which was actually tied for fourth. So they did not run for a, a lot of yardage on the season. Um, but they, when they did run the ball, they were, you know, fairly successful um, with the fifth, with the top, with the fourth highest yards per carry. So they, they, you know, this team is a is a team that basically is a, a team that could not finish. That that was the, that was their biggest issue. They could not finish defensively. They were tenth against the run at 179 yards per game, and they allowed an average of 4.4 yards per carry, which would put them at eighth in the league uh, in that category. Uh, passing offense, they were seventh at, a, at 212 yards per game, 18 touchdowns, 14 interceptions. As you can see, those 14 interceptions it is a big a big thing that that really hurt this team um, at, on the season. And they also um, fumbled the ball 20 times and lost 11. So they turned the ball over a total of 25 times on the season. And when you do that, you know, it's going to be hard to beat anybody uh, defensively. They were 10th in the league in passing defense. At 249 yards per game, they had allowed 23 touchdowns and six interceptions to go along with um, 11 fumbles that they got, that they took away. So they they had a um, 17 takeaways on the season, so giving them a turn a turnover ratio of minus eight. Um, so you know you're already going in, you know you're already behind. You can't, you know, you turn the ball over way too much, and you're not turning the other team over. So that's that was probably the biggest issue for this team was not being able to stay on the field. You know, they, they were pretty successful running the ball um, when they did it, but they just couldn't, they just couldn't finish. Uh, they, they were second in the league um, in kickoff, re kickoff returns with 22.8 yards per return and three touchdowns. So they definitely took advantage of that uh, punt returns. They were seventh in the league averaging 9.2 yards per return uh, kickoffs. They averaged 35.2 net yards per kick, and they uh, had a total average of 51.4 um, yards per kick. And they only had one touchback on the season, so they they definitely, kicking game-wise, did not help their defense a lot. They put themselves in a lot of bad positions, um, field position-wise. Field goals, they were eighth in the league at four, four of six. They only attempted six field goals on the season. So as you can see, just a lot of issues scoring the ball. Uh, either way it goes, extra points they were thirty of thirty three for ninety percent. That's tenth in the league. Uh, punting they were second in the league with a thirty seven point six uh, net average per punt. They uh, had a total a total average of forty two point one yards per punt. So they punted the ball well. Like I said, it just just could not finish anything. They allowed uh, 24 sacks on the season, which was sixth in the league, and they registered 24 sacks on the season, which was also sixth in the league, and they were 10th in the league in interceptions with six on the season. So, uh, first downs, they averaged 16.1 first downs per game, and they had a total of 177 first downs. Defensively, the opponents had 22.5 first downs per game, which was 11th in the league, and a total of 247. Third down conversions, Bethune-Cookman was 47 of 128 for 36%. That's good for ninth in the league. Uh, the opponents were 40, uh, 75 of 156 for 48%. That was last in the league. So they allowed far too many third down conversions. And they did not really, they did not really convert a lot of third downs. So it, they just, whether it was third downs or turnovers, they this offense just could not stay on the field. The defense just could not get any stops. Fourth down conversions, they were uh, ninth in the league, three of eight for thirty-seven percent. So they couldn't even really convert third fourth downs if they needed to. Uh, the opponents uh, were fourteen of seventeen on fourth down for eighty-two percent. That was last in the league. So. One way or the other, the opponents kept on driving, whether it was third downs or fourth downs. Um, but Don Cookman just could not stop anybody or, or they could not convert on their own. Uh, penalties, they averaged 65.9 yards per game in penalties, 83 total. That's ninth in the league. Uh, the opponents averaged 65.6 yards per game in penalties and 77 penalties. So the opponents, that, that put them at fifth in the league. Red zone offense, they were eighth in the league with um, 
85% conversions. They were 29 or 34. They had 25, uh, 25 touchdowns, 14 rushing, 11 passing, and they were four or five on field goals uh, with one fumble in the red zone and two turnovers on down. So they only kicked six field goals and five of them were inside the 20. So they just did not really either have any trust in their kicker or they just never really, you know, they either got in the red zone or they, 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 they turned it over before they got there. So they didn't really have very many opportunities. Uh, to do anything there. Defensively, they were 11th in the league, uh, 43 of 48 in the red zone for 89%. Uh, they allowed 35 touchdowns on the season, 23 rushing and 12 passing. Uh, the opponents were 8 for 8 on field goals inside the red zone. They forced three fumbles in the red zone um, to turn the opponents over. Uh, looking at some individual stats for the for the Wildcats, um, they were led in rushing by Quayshawn Bird. He averaged uh, 56 yards per game. He had 618 yards on 125 carries and five touchdowns. He averaged 4.9 yards per carry. Uh, Devin Black, 45 carries, 254 yards, 5.6 yards per carry, one touchdown. Jimmy Robinson, the third, uh, 58, 58 carries, uh, 229 yards, 3.9 yards per carry, and six touchdowns. Uh, Darian War Wilson, 28 carries. Um, 120 yards, 4.3 yards per carry, two touchdowns. Aaron Thompson, 25 carries, 71 yards, 2.8 yards per carry, one touchdown. Shannon Patrick was the leading passer on the season, 118 of 192. Uh, 10, 10 interceptions, nine touchdowns, 1,360 yards. He completed 53% of his passes. Devin Black, 62 of 121, nine touchdowns, four interceptions, 51% completion rate. Um, as you can see, they played two quarterbacks probably since the midpoint of the season. Uh, Black started the last few games um, as Patrick just turned the ball over a lot. Uh, he had interception issues, and that, that really did him in. Uh, Kamari Averett, who most of us know is probably the best tight end in the league and probably one of, if not the best tight end in FCS football, he caught 52 passes on the season for 888 yards, every 17 yards per catch, and 10 touchdowns. Um, dude was electric. You know, he was a, definitely a, 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 um, an automatic target for them. Daryl Powell caught 22 passes for 471 yards, 21 yards per catch. Nice deep threat there. Two touchdowns. Uh, Dwayne uh, Devon Ellington, 17 catches, 195 yards, uh, one touchdown, 11.4 yards per catch. Dylan Lee, 13 catches, 185 yards, two touchdowns. Marcus Riley, 15 catches, um, 175 yards and one touchdown. Defensively, Ontario Johnson was the, one of their best defenders. He led the team with 101 total tackles. Uh, Caleb Sutherland was second with 74. To Keevan Thomas, Thomas with 72 was third. Devontae Hampton was fourth with 43. Um, Tony Bowman, fifth with 40 tackles for loss. Sutherland, eight and a half. Thomas, eight. Reeves, six and a half. Bowman, McKenzie, and Hall each had six. Johnson with five and a half. Sacks, Sutherland led the lead, led the team with five and a half sacks. On the, four and a half sacks on the season, three and a half for Reeves and Bowman each. Uh, Knight, two and a half. Thomas and McKenzie and Ham Hampton each had two. Interceptions, Omari Hill Robinson and had four. On the season, they had that kid is amazing. He's gonna um, be a guy to keep a lookout for this season. Uh, Sutherland had one, and Thomas had the other interception for the Wildcats. Uh, Benjamin Lennon was the punter. He averaged 42 yards per punt, uh, six touchbacks on the season, uh, 16 punts inside the 20 and 10 50 plus yard punts, as long with 63 uh, field goals. Dylan. Mark Magadam, he had uh, he was one of three on the season. Marcus Gamboa was two of four on the seat, two or two on the season. Um, their longest field goal on the season was forty three, was thirty two yards. So they they did not, like I said, they, they just did not kick a lot of field goals, and they definitely didn't kick anything long. They only kicked one forty. They they kicked one field goal from forty yards or more, forty to forty nine yards, and one field goal from fifty yards plus. So they they just did not kick a lot of field goals outside the red zone. Uh, McDonald was the leading 
uh, kickoff man. He averaged 58 yards per kick and one touchback uh, on the return game. Uh, Justin Tuggle was the leading punt returner. He had eight returns for 10, 10.7 yards per return and 86 yards total. Darnell Dees is one of the top two return men in the conference. Um, he has 17 returns, 476 yards, 28-yard average, and two touchdowns. Also, Quayshawn Bird had a kickoff return for a touchdown. He averaged 22.5 yards per return. Uh, Jimmy Robinson averaged 25 yards per return on seven returns. So they they had multiple guys that could return kicks for them. So they that, that was definitely one of their best, best attributes was kick return. Um, moving on to this upcoming season, um, I expect the Bethune Cookman offense to improve um, a lot. I think, like I said, I think turnovers and third down conversions are definitely going to have to be key for this team um, to stay on the field. They need to stay on the field. Um, they return a lot of weapons on that on that offense. They return um, basically almost all of their top all of their top receivers coming back. Plus, they add Corey Reed from Jackson State. Um, as a transfer, as another offensive weapon. Um, so they, they're, they're going to be targets there. Um, Kamari Everett returns, and that's definitely a key target. Um, with a new quarterback coming into the fold, um, probably either Jalen Jones or uh, Walter Simmons, um, although I think Jones will probably get the nod early. Um, Everett is a great security blanket for you, man. He's a guy that can stretch the field as a big guy. He could be a red zone threat. You know, he can be a guy who can move the chains. He can do it all for you. Um, Daryl Powell is a guy who can get down the field and make some plays for you. Um, and they they have multiple guys. Um, you know, Bird caught 20 passes as a running back. So that's a great weapon out of the backfield to help you out as well. So if you can take advantage of that, and they have a new offensive coordinator, Mike Kanellis. Um, so if you can take advantage of those weapons that you have, um, you're returning two of your top rushers in Robinson and Bird. So that's, you know, that's another key factor. Um Quarterback and you know in the office if the offensive line can protect and, and open up holes, then this offense should be pretty good. I expect the offensive numbers to improve a lot um, because I think they're gonna be able to move the ball. Like I said, as long as they cut down the turnovers and they convert, you know, they, they, they increase the third down conversion rate. I think this offense has the potential to be dangerous. Um they you know they may not be a championship level or, or division contending offense, but I think they'll be an offense that can boost them up to that third or fourth spot um, if things can fall their way. Now, defensively, they took a lot of losses on defense. Uh, they do return Omari Hill Robinson um, at cornerback, who I think is one of the top guys in the league at that position. Uh, he had four interceptions last year, so that's a guy who definitely is going to help this offense, help this defense. But I think the defense took too many losses um, to really be a, a huge factor this season. I think the offense is going to have to carry the load um, for the bulk of the season to the defense can, you know, can find some guys. When you lose a guy uh, like Ontario Johnson, who ever, who had 101 tackles on the season, when you lose a guy like that, that that's really going to, you know, change the perception of your defense. Uh, that's a guy who you could count on to make a play. Um, 60, of those, 60 of those tackles were solo, so he was very capable of, of you know, making tackles. You know, without any help, you know, or, or just, you know, if he is in a one-on-one -on -one situation, he probably was going to get you on the ground. So losing a guy like that is definitely going to hurt this uh, hurt this defense. And um, they, they're they going to have to try to find guys. Now, they – but don't cook me, hit the portal pretty hard. You know, they recruited some nice some nice pieces. So, you know, we'll see if they can plug in some guys to fill that, fill that hole because defensively they were the opposite of the offense. They just – they could not really turn you over. And they could not stop you on third down or fourth down. So they have to change that. The third down conversion rate must drop um, drastically. Uh, the fourth down conversion rate needs to drop drastically. And they need to find a way to increase their turnovers um, to get the offense better field position. That also bleeds into the kickoff game. Um, you know, you want to see them with um, better, better, better kickoff uh, coverage on the, seat, on, the, on the year and also just better all around kicking. Um, maybe get able to get more touchbacks and, and you know, to get a, get some confidence in your kicking game um, as an added weapon to give you points in certain situations, um, you know, only kicking, you know, one field goal or one or two field goals outside of the red zone 
it is not good. I mean, I, I, I'm not a big believer in red zone field goals, especially if you get inside the 10. Um, I feel like you should score touchdowns down there. But if you can't, then you need to come out of there with points. And uh, once you get into that, you know, between the 20 and the 30, 35 yard line, you know, that's where a lot of your field goals come in at. So you need to really be able to take advantage of that and get points in those situations when you get down there. Um, and that, that's probably one of the reasons why that, that offense could not finish drives because they did not have the confidence in their kicking game to take those points. And that's something that you're going to have to improve on this season. Um, the schedule is not it's not really, really bad. I mean, they only have one FBS game this year, although it's a big one um, against the University of Miami on September 3rd. Uh, Miami is one of the top teams in the ACC this season. So, um, you know, they're going to be tough. Um, they're going to be a tough team to, to beat. Um, but you want to come out and play, play well, you know, just kind of take advantage of, of the opportunity and, you know, get your feet wet in the first game and find out, you know, where, where you are in certain aspects. Now, that South Carolina State game on September 10th is at home. And they, you know, South Carolina State jumped out to a huge lead against them last season, but they were able to rally back. Uh, they came up short. Uh, this is a South Carolina State team that won all their games in conference at a rough uh, non-conference slate um, other than the Bethune-Cookman game. Um, they had a rough non-conference slate. And, you know, they're coming in with a lot of, you know, a lot of a lot of pride. And, you know, they're, they're defending Celebration Bowl champs. And this is going to be a tough matchup to open up your home schedule. But, you know, it's a game if you can – if that offense can move the ball and that defense can find a way to get you a few stops, you can find yourself in this game. Um, I think that you can um, – like I said, you can find yourself in this game now, whether you win it or not, that's always going to be, you know, the key is, and that's going to be up to this team, this defense, really to keep you in this game. Uh, September twenty fourth, they get a very early bye week. Um, in week three, I think that's a little early, but they get a bye week on September seventeenth, and September twenty fourth, they host Grambling. Um, Grambling is going to be a different team than they played last season. You know, a lot of people feel like Grambling could easily be. The West Division, the West Division champ, as far as you know, a lot of people's early season predictions go. Um, but we'll see about about that. Um, this is going to be a good a good test for this team. Grambling's defense is, is pretty solid. Um, offensively, I think they're going to be improved. So this is an interesting game to kind of you know start the start the swag schedule off with. Um, it's a game that you know that is not out of the realm that they win it. Um, but you know it's definitely going to be a, a, a tough matchup. Uh, moving on to the, the next game, which is on um, October 1st. They go to Alabama a and This uh, was a game I felt like they let get away last year, a and this season. Obviously, um, breaking in new quarterback, but they still have some nice explosive pieces on offense. Uh, their defense is going to have to prove that they can stop people. Um, they're, they're retooling the defense. I think Coach Manor said they're going to have 11 new starters. I don't know about – I don't know all – I'm not 100% certain about that. I feel like they probably got a couple of guys who are going to be able to get those spots that had them last season. But, you know, that that's, you know, a huge turnover on your defense one way or the other. So this could be a game that the offense can get on track. Um, the defense held up pretty well last year against an explosive offense, although it was a very rainy game. But they did, you know, hold their own in that game. So I, I think the defense can maybe find that footing in this game, and the offense can too. Um, it's going to be a, you know, a valuable game because they go on the road the next week to Tennessee State, um, which should be a tough game. Tennessee State, although they were picked fourth in the OVC, um, a lot of people feel like this team has improved a lot. Um, so this could be a very tough affair. It'd be homecoming for Tennessee State, so that's definitely another another factor for Bethune-Cookman to uh, kind of overcome. And then they come home on October 15th to place Jackson State. Well, they go to they, uh, Jacksonville. This game was moved from Daytona to Jacksonville. Um, so I, I think, you know, you moved a game that you probably could have got, a, you know, packed out that little stadium. You put it in a, a big, huge stadium. I know they, you know, they've had the Gateway Classic for years, and I think they may be trying to, you know, revitalize that. But, you know, I think this was a game that probably you could have benefited from playing at home, but you know it's in Jacksonville, so I, you know, they they got blowed out against JSU, and I think it's, you know it's going to be tough to you know to compete in this game. Although you know it's not impossible, 
but I think it's going to be a tough, a tough matchup for them. Um, October 22nd, they go to Itabino to take on the Delta Devils. Valley came to Daytona and beat them last season, so this is going to be tough. Valley is going to be a tough team. Um, they, you know, they they bringing in one of the top junior college quarterbacks. Um, they returning Caleb Johnson, who is one of the best running backs in the conference. You know, defensively they're going to be tough, and they're tough at home. So this is not a you know not an easy game. Obviously, since they lost it last year, but it's a game that they if the, the, it's manageable. You know, if they can find a way to win, this is a good test for them. Um, they may be coming off of a couple of losses, so this is a good test for for them to kind of you know find their way. Um, October 29th, they go to Prairie View, so two long trips back to back. Um, one to Mississippi, and then one to uh, um, Prairie View. So two long trips back to back. I think this is I think this is probably where your bye week should have came, either in between these games or after these games. But I'm not the schedule maker. Uh, this Prairie View is an enigma right now. You know a lot. They they feel they should be you know higher than where they are. A lot of people feel like you know this maybe be lower than where they were projected. But you know they're you know they're breaking in a lot of new pieces. Um, they do have some returning weapons. Um, on that team defensively, they're going to have some new pieces. But this is a tough game. Like I said, coming off of you know Tennessee State, Jackson State on the road at Valley, and then this another long trip. Um, you know, I don't know where the team is going to be at. You know, record wise, you know, this is a tough. This is a tough game, and that bleeds into the November 5th game um, at home against Alabama State, who can be much improved. I mean, Bethune-Cookman is playing well. This could be the game that decides who finishes third or fourth, you know, um, in in this conference. So this is a very a very interesting game, and it was a pretty nip-and-tuck affair for a while. Alabama State pulled away last season, and then they go to Alcorn on the November 12th uh, to take on the Braves. And Alcorn, like I said, I figure I feel like Alcorn is going to be one of the top teams in the West. So um, I, I don't expect this to be an easy matchup for, for Bethune Cookman on the road. And I, I kind of um, think Alcorn may have that one. And then they close out on November uh, 19th in the Florida Classic against Florida and them, who is appearing to be just as strong as they were last season. So that can be a dangerous, um, dangerous game for Bethune Cookman. Um, it to, to pull out. So looking at the schedule, like I said, it's not uh I mean it's basically all uh, all FCS schedule with the exception of the University of Miami. So um then the other two non-conference games are not easy and, and uh one is at home, one is on the road. So you know it I don't know if they can steal one of those two games. Um I think South Carolina State may be a tough ass uh Tennessee State at this point in the season who knows they may be you know they may be on that road that a lot of people think they are going to be on. So, um, like I say, not a lot of games where I can just point to and say, okay, this is a dub. Um, or, you know, there's a, a few toss up games and there's a few, you know, I, 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 for my purposes, I would say for show games that they are probably going to lose. Um, I, you know, like I say, I, I think looking at the schedule, um, if, if I feel like they, they can't win any of the non-conference games, that's already three losses. Um, I see them with five games that I would say that they are an underdog and they would be um, – they would have like a less than 25% chance of winning. Um, and that's FAMU, JSU, Tennessee State, South Carolina State, and, of course, Miami. So that leaves the rest of the games as basically toss-up games. So and I, I, I think I would throw all corn in that, in that 25%. Cause I think Alcorn is going to be a, a really good team this season. So, um, and that's a you know that's a road game. That's their third uh, long road trip for them in in four weeks. Uh, like I said, the schedule makers did them no favor right there. But they, um, I think, I think best case the team probably can be a seven and four team. You know, if the defense can come together um, and, and find their way, um, and they can win a couple of swing games in conference like. Uh, Alabama, if they can win the Alabama and them, Alabama State and Valley games, I think that puts them in a good position to finish third or fourth um, in the conference. If they can't win any of those games, then they may finish last. So I think this team can finish anywhere between third and sixth in the division. Uh, I'm I'm leaning more toward uh, fifth or sixth, um, depending on how a few games shake out. So I think this team will probably be like 
uh, five and six or six and five um, at, 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 in my estimation. Because, like I said, they have some hard games, but if this offense can, you know, find their way, I think they can be a, a, a pretty solid team. Now, defensively, it's going to be probably the key for this team um, to reach that next level. If the defense is playing well, then I think the offense will, will feed off of that um, and vice versa. So, right now, I'm, I'm going to say five and six, you know, with a, maybe six and five. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of where I stand. So, that's going to do it for this episode of Swag Talk. And, um, of course, we'll be back Sunday with another edition of Swag Talk as we preview the Florida and them Rattlers. So that should be a good show, so make sure you check that one out. Also, don't forget, check out those Swag Talk t-shirts, man. Hit me up if you want one. One for 25, two for 40. Uh, we can get that popping for you. So with that being said, man, I'm C. Wells uh, stopping this tour bus on this tour around the Swag, and I'll catch y'all on the rebound. Peace.